Go with me, if you could, to Exodus. Go to Exodus, and as you go there, I'm going to talk a little bit, because listen, guys, I, I just feel an urgency. You heard, it, you heard me mention it earlier. I, feel, I wonder if this is a good crowd today. Let me just check. If, you, if you're on fire today, say amen. I don't know. You can never tell, you know, who I'm, who I'm bucking up on today. Okay. So this is, I feel a sense of urgency spiritually. Spiritual urgency, okay? Spiritual urgency because I feel that this is a moment and a season when we can't waste time. I'm telling you guys, receive this. If you believe I'm a man of God and, and I'm your man of God, if I'm not, I don't know why you're here. But, but, but you need to find somebody who, can, who has that right, that connection to speak into your life. In this church, we don't think you have to use old English to speak into somebody's life. Come hither thou thence, thus saith the Lord. Uh, you can be fun and still hear from God. And, uh, but I sense an urgency in the spirit that this year we're going to see so many uh, crazy things, but we have an urgency not to waste time and to make sure we draw close to God. Look at your neighbor and say, I heard that. And I want you to understand that you cannot waste time with people who are there to dis dis distract you and, and, and get involved in arguments and nonsense. And listen, my singles especially, but also people in your, your partnerships and your companies, you've got to only deal with people who see the value in you. Okay, all right, they don't, they don't like that today. I wonder if I've got the balcony at least on my side. You've got to deal with people who only see the value in you. This is, this is the year to recognize you don't need to be rude. You just need to go missing from some people. Some people you need to treat them like a fire, like a flame. It's too hot for me to get too near that. So I'm going to keep my distance. I'll love you from a distance. I'll celebrate when you get your victories, but you're too dangerous for my environment. If you don't value... Oh, oh, if you don't value who I am in God, then really, you're, you're not for my environment this year. I'm getting too old to waste time with haters, with backbiters, with people I don't know if I can trust you. I, I, I ain't got time for that. Who wants to walk around looking over their shoulder like this? No, no, I ain't got time for that this year. This is the, I just feel an anointing on me to tell you this. This is the year you've got to understand if they don't see you how God sees you, say, see you. You've got to be prepared to walk away from some folk. This don't call for rudeness. This don't call for you being a, a warfare person. It just calls for you to be conscious, discerning, recognizing I just ain't got time. <laughs> God, I feel like preaching that. I, I, I didn't come to, I come to teach today on something completely different, but I feel like telling somebody, you ain't got time. I know you're young. I know you're only in your thirties. You're only in your twenties, but you ain't got, I know that's bad English. You ain't. For the posher amongst us, you haven't. You haven't got time to waste this is a year don't play with people who are playing with your value no baby no 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 bro no 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 don't play don't get into contracts with people who can't see you as God sees you if they don't I'm gonna say it for the people in the back one more time for the people on the balcony if they don't see you how God sees you say see you and feel no regrets, walk away, don't turn back, don't be like Lot's wife, don't turn back, just keep on walking. Because some of you are too gifted, you're too gifted to allow mud around you. God, I don't know where this is coming from, Lord. But this is the year you need to wake up and say, no, 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 I'm not playing this year. Okay, is that how you're going to treat me? If it takes you three days to respond to my text, then, you know, it's good. I understand. Believe how they treat you. Believe it. No, no, no. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe they were, no, no, maybe they were nothing. They weren't busy. They saw it. <laughs> nothing. Bad English. Lord, I don't know what's happened to me today. I got, you believe it? I got qualifications in English, fam, and I'm talking like this. I'm telling you, this, this is the year to believe how they treat you. You don't need to be rude back because you're a kingdom person. You just recognize, I see me different from how you see me. 
And if you don't, if you don't recognize when it's time to create boundaries and walk away, then you're training them how to trick you. I didn't come to say none of this. Lord have mercy. I don't know what's going on. I, I know this isn't sophisticated. This isn't smooth, organized, but I just feel God pushing me in this direction. Somebody in here needs to wake up and recognize that you are an eagle. You need to fly higher than the people who you've been walking around, the dogs on. If you ever, if you ever see an eagle in the mouth of a dog, That's a strange picture. That's a, that's a weird picture. Those of us who put on our Colombo jackets, young people don't know about that. Okay. We, we have to investigate. An eagle in the mouth of a dog don't make no sense. An eagle in the mouth of the dog, you've got to understand, you've got to ask yourself the question, well, well what was the eagle doing? So low that it ended up getting chewed up by the mouth of a dog. Some of you are hanging around with too much dogs. You're supposed to be flying higher than you've been flying. Your conversation, your environment, I wish I had, and, and, and oh God, it's wasting time. And the problem is some of you go so low because you've got good hearts. Oh God. They tell me I preach too long as it is, Jesus. Some of you have got good hearts and you're so giving. Giving and giving and giving till you're in emotional overdraft and you ain't even got enough energy for your own assignment. You know why you're tired? You're tired because you're just taking too many calls. And you're giving of yourself all the time. And God does not expect you to die on a cross that he already died on. I'm called to love people, yeah, but there's a limit. I, I, see, see, the difference is God is love. I, I'm not love. I have love. <laughs> Yeah, fam. I'm, listen, if you get around me, you know I've got love. Anybody who works with us, our teams, our family, they'll tell you I've got love, but I am not love. If I have love, that means there's a limit. But God is love, so he's limitless. Me, I've got to put a boundary in place. And some of you need to understand this year you have the right to say no. You have the right to walk away. You have the right. No, don't feel guilty. Don't feel bad. Just don't do it and walk away. All right. This month is our theme. And our theme this month is March forward. Push your neighbor and say, March is marching this month. Come on, tell you. March forward. We are going forward this month. In the month of March, and it's interesting the language we're using already because the language is the language of military. It's the language of the military. It's military phraseology. And sometimes when you read the scriptures, the scriptures speak to God's people as a family. Other times there's two real primary issues or two primary there are two primary uh, contexts that the word of God speaks to God's people in. In one context, sometimes we're spoken to as a family. In, in other contexts, we're spoken to as an army. Sometimes we're a family. Sometimes we're an army. We're an army who's a family and we're a family who's an army. Hey. Because sometimes you have to fight together to push through difficult seasons. Now, the weapons of our army are not like physical natural armies our weapons are prayer praise come on now somebody our weapons are slightly different we have spiritual weapons but we are an army nonetheless sometimes if you see your comrade your your brother uh, falling if you see him going low if you see him dipping if you see him going below where he really is called to be you've got to get next to your brother and pray with him and push him forward and sometimes your praise is on behalf of other people They've got, that's why I tell you sometimes, let, praise God for your neighbor's breakthrough. Because sometimes your neighbor don't feel like they're going to get a breakthrough. But if they can see you believing for them, I, I wish somebody on, praise is infectious. 
Jesus, I can't wait to do our series on praise. I wish somebody would understand. God ain't called you just to come here and just to sit down and fold your arms with long hands. He's called you to give him the glory because your praise helps push somebody else. Sometimes we're an army, sometimes we're a family, sometimes we're a family, sometimes we're an army. We're an army who's a family and we're a family who can fight. And this year, for some people, it's going to be a fight year. And the first warfare you have to win is the warfare within. Mm. Beating your own negative thoughts. Beating your own self-doubts. And you can't do this by yourself. You've got to have a battalion around you. That's why you can't, that's why I told you this year, you ain't got time to wonder who's for you and who's against you. Some people will go AWOL, absent without leave, when God has called them to be with you, that's on them. But you need to carry on going with the people God has left you with. And one of the greatest texts, I would argue, for us to read to get encouragement, and I'm not here really to preach today, I'm just opening the series today. We're going to start in the shallow end of the pool. And then we're going to swim a little deeper as the weeks go on into different areas concerning March forward. But one of the one of the key things here when it comes to understanding what to read and when to read it, when it comes to pushing forward and marching forward, some of the greatest texts to read, and we're going to go into some of them today, is the book of Exodus and also the book of Joshua. Exodus and Joshua. Exodus and anything to do with, somebody shout Joshua. Moses and Joshua. Anything to do with Moses leading the people out, and anything to do with Joshua leading the people in to the promised land. It's interesting because right here in Exodus chapter 13, we're about to pick up. And I want to say some stuff before I get to it. I'm going to be walking real fast today through the text. So those of you making notes, you get your pens ready, your devices, whatever, and grab what you can. It's important for us to recognize that the enemy doesn't mind our existence so long as we have no mobility. He don't mind you being at church so long as you're going nowhere. He don't mind you going so long as you're not growing. <laughs> this is why religiosity in its most negative pejorative, if we could borrow it for a moment and apply it in that context, is just monotony. It's rituals, just rituals. But actually, I don't go to church when I wake up on Sundays. I go to change because I believe that the best of me is in the rest of me and there's an environment that brings that out of me. And that environment is the kingdom of God and God's church and the atmosphere. I come for the nutrients. I wish I had 500 of you shout back, amen. I come for the nutrients that's in the soil and the atmosphere of this place, because as I join in and I come into this place, something feeds the potential on the inside of me. And I walk out feeling bigger. You should never walk out feeling smaller. You should walk out feeling bigger like you've been fueled up. It's a petrol station. I've come for more fuel so I can keep pushing, marching forward into where God's called me to go. Last month, we slowed the car right down, and we had fun, and, and we got some information, hopefully bringing transformation for relationships, and everybody's excited about that, and that's wonderful. But I want to remind you of a couple of things, because if you, if you even look in the natural, in the natural, I think it was Linda Poon, in an article she did for Bloomsburg, uh, they found out that people who started this year, started a year, any year, but especially when you look at how non-committal people can be in these most modern years. It's said that those people, especially when it comes to the easy things that we can use as references and points to paint a picture like the gym. People who made themselves resolutions and bought memberships and and committed to start projects, whether that project was your body, whether that project was something else. The fact is they say that people, people actually start the projects and there is a wild uplift, a surge in the percentage of commitments and gym memberships and other things that get stirred and online searches and people taking courses as January kicks off. Woo! January kicks off. But, but then they say by the second week in February, 
there's a marked difference as those memberships now because a lot of the time we have digital cards that we have to tap and, and, and digital processes that can help us register and carry out uh, uh, record keeping for the metrics. They can measure how dips take place and they say by the second week of February there is a drop of 40%. And they say that's just the beginning because by the time you get to March, that can even drop up to 70%. Which means only 30% of the people hey, who decided to start their project and, and, and kill it this year. And this is my year. And those people in January, by March, many of them have dipped or quit. This is why we as a kingdom people, we decided to declare that this month, March, is the year, or is the month rather in this year that we have to make sure we remind people to march forward. Push your neighbor, say, that's for you. Keep going, keep going. Come on, push, push the other neighbor, say, that's for you. You've got to keep going. Don't quit. We are not going to be like the world because when we talk about we don't follow the patterns of this world, you all think that not following the patterns of this world just refers to sin. But actually, the patterns of this world also refers to the metrics of quitology. We are not quitters. We're kingdom people and we keep pushing forward. And so I want to speak to you like a commander in an army today. And I want to give some orders out and I want to declare march forward. I don't know what you began in January, what you promised yourself you'd achieve, what you said you'd commit to, what you said was going to get done. But I want to encourage you, I don't know how you felt dips in February. I don't know if you felt dips at the end of January. I don't know if you've quit at, by the end of February into March. But I want to tell you to pick yourself up and march forward. Slap your neighbor high five and tell them march forward. But to march forward, we've got to be real on some areas that actually give us hiccups and hurdles and problems and distractions and pull us off the course as we march forward. And, and, and let me talk about the first one here because I think it's interesting for you to recognize a couple of things. Number one, I, I want you to realize this and I, and I need you to mark yourself on this and be real with yourself. I know you're sitting next to your friend who you're trying to impress and you're wondering if they're gonna be looking over your shoulder watching your notes, who cares what they think? Tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. <laughs> it's important for you to be real with yourself and ask yourself, how am I with these areas? Because right here in Exodus chapter 13 already, read a few of these scriptures here. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 to 18, we're talking about God delivering his people, the Hebrews, delivering them from the affliction of the Egyptian narcissistic despotic system run by the cacistocracy of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the governor, he's the king, he's the demigod in his own eyes and the eyes of the Egyptian royal family over Egypt. And of course, Hebrews, the Hebrews have been slaves for 400 years, at least. Some say 430. They first went into Egypt as a family, they were welcomed once Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament, not Jesus' stepfather, they were welcomed in as a family. They grew, they grew, they grew, they grew, they grew until they became a threat in the eyes of the Egyptian government. And so they placed them in Goshen, placed them in slavery. And of course, as they're in slavery there, it's fascinating to me that they're still finding themselves prospering in terms of their growth, especially numerically, until a new pharaoh takes over and switches everything on them. And you know the story, they're in Egypt and they're crying out to God and there's something we can learn already because they're crying out to God and sometimes when you're crying out to God, you're wondering, God, why am I not hearing back from you? They're over here in Egypt, they're in Egypt crying out to God, God, this is terrible, this is horrific, we're under affliction, where is the God of our forefathers? We've been here for over 400 years, our generation after generation of slaves have been here, this is horrible, God, they're crying out to God and that's the language the Bible uses they're crying out to God but they're not hearing God answer them back and they're not hearing God answer them back and sometimes we get discouraged if we don't feel like God is answering us back but you've got to understand that God is always answering he's just not always answering in the way you're expecting because while they're crying out to God over here, if you come out of Egypt all the way into the wilderness, into the family of a man called Jethro, Moses is now in that family. He's married Jethro's daughter. And while, 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 while they're crying out, while they're crying out, God is shaping the answer. 
He's teaching Moses principles on how to lead people. He's saying, this is how you lead people, and here's your practice pitch. Your practice pitch. Because nobody ever sees the practice pitch. Nobody knows the practice pitch of Arsenal, of Manchester United. Hardly anybody knows the practice pitch of Tottenham. Hardly anybody, unless you're an avid, avid fan, you really don't know. You know the main ground, but you don't know the practice pitch. Because they don't practice on the same pitch they play the main matches. And so while he's over here in the practice pitch, he's in the practice pitch. And what does the practice pitch look like? The practice pitch isn't nice. It's not great. He's looking after sheep. He's looking after his father-in-law's sheep. One taking them through the wilderness, looking for stuff to eat. He's wandering around the wilderness while they're crying out. And they're wondering, well, God, why aren't you sending the answer? Why aren't you sending the answer? God, what's going on? God, uh, we're not hearing from him. Uh, we might as well give up. We might as well throw the towel in. We might as well. And some of us, some of us are judging them right now. But actually, that's how we are sometimes. When we're not hearing from God, instead of understanding that you've got to trust God, to know that if he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, then there's something working for your good. And you don't want him to send you a Moses who, who's never walked through the wilderness. Okay, maybe, I'm, maybe while I'm here, let me see how many people have got faith in here. Let me see how many people really believe in here. Let me see how many people really trust in here. Maybe while I'm saying, God, say, where's my husband, Lord? I've been single for so long. Oh, Lord. Maybe God is over here in the practice pitch shaping somebody up to know how to look after you just right. And if you really believe that, you wouldn't quit on God. You wouldn't throw the towel in. You wouldn't stop praising God because you know that God is working out things for your good. Just because I can't see it don't mean it's not happening. Okay? Just because I can't see it doesn't mean God isn't working on it. And so God is working on a Moses. He raises Moses up. He raises Moses up, and then you'll know the story. I don't need to teach it like a Sunday school class. Moses gets sent into Egypt. Oh, God, I can't wait to talk this, about this on Wednesday night, about the voice of God. Because Moses doesn't just hear from God and go. Moses hears from God and then checks with a spiritual authority before he makes his move. Because many people need to understand, especially in this day and age, how to really discern and know that it was God. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that on Wednesday night. But, but the fact is, first Wednesday is this Wednesday, right? Yeah, first Wednesday is this Wednesday, Wednesday night. We're excited about that. But Moses gets sent down there. and he's, His spiritual authority, Jephro, says, yep, you should go. That makes sense. Go, go, go. And Moses goes into Egypt and he, he, he walks up into Pharaoh's face and he says, God told me to tell you to let my people go. Pharaoh's resistant. You'll know the story. I don't need to teach it like Sunday school. But what's interesting is they leave. They eventually leave. And on the night they leave, it's fascinating to me that God has them do the unusual. They do the unusual and God takes them out through the leadership of Moses. But here, here, this is, this is strange. He's taken them out, not just to take them out, to take them out. Because God never delivers you just to deliver you. If God gets you off, the drama, the court case, the difficulty. He's not just got you off to get you off. He's taken you out to take you in. There's a destination that he has for you. These people, the Hebrews, were being delivered from Egypt, not just to be delivered from Egypt, but for them to go to a place called the promised land. Canaan's happy land, as the old folks used to sing it. Canaan, Canaan, Canaan. They're going to the promised land, a land that flowed with milk and honey, as they say, uh, which is terminology that describes the, the fertility of the atmosphere of that land. And so he's not just taking them out to take them out. He's taking them out to take them in. Now, the distance, most of you will have heard this before, but let's repeat it nonetheless. The distance from where they were coming from, Egypt, to go to Canaan, should have been two weeks. Two weeks, at, at minimum 11 days to two weeks. But look what the scripture says here. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 to 18. And I've got a phrase for this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country. That's the two week journey. Though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds. And returned to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. There's a contradiction there. There's something slightly confusing. 
Because the Bible says, if you're still here, I can teach this. Can I teach this a little bit? Can I teach this a little bit? It's okay. The Bible says that God did not take them the shortcut. Okay. 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 God does not do shortcuts. Why? 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 Because that route, there was something that it was going to require from the inside of them that they were not yet. Okay. 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 There's a certain thing they needed to have. They need to have the character of warriors. Lord Jesus. It would take the character of warriors to go the short route because they knew that the Philistines were going to try and prevent them going through their territory. And God says, look, there's a shorter route, but I'm not going to do the shortcut because you're not ready in your character yet. But hold on, pastor. It says here, the Israelites, last clause, went up out of Egypt ready for battle. The ready for battle there is not character. They were coming out looking like an army, believing they were an army, but actually they weren't ready yet. Okay. And sometimes God will take you the scenic route. The longer route, and some people get frustrated, they get upset with God. Why is this taking so long? I want to march forward. But here's the thing I want to say to you. We get disappointed. And I want you to ask yourself this question. How many of us trust God enough that we can overcome being disappointed by the distance to your destiny? Disappointed by the distance is taking too long. I want to march forward, Pastor, but I've been marching forward for the last five years and it's taking too long. Disappointed by the distance. See, we get excited. We get excited by the destiny. When, when God tells us where we're going to go, where he wants to take us, the business he wants us to set up, the, the charity, the, the, the ministry, the whatever it might be, we get excited by the, by, by the sound of the destiny, but then we start quitting because of the distance. Most of us, let's tell the truth, would have been like, God, don't worry, we can handle it, let's go the shortcut. They end up taking, watch this now, you all know the story, I don't need to preach this like your children, but they end up taking around 40 years before they step foot in the promised land. Because God needed to work on them, not just to get, hey, 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 not just to get them out of Egypt. You know where I'm going. But to get Egypt out of them. Egypt is so much in them. Where they've come from is so much in them that on one occasion, while they're waiting for Moses to come back from a prayer meeting with God, they're waiting and the waiting takes so long. Oh God. It takes so long. They decide, let's build God ourselves. Why should we wait for Moses Seeing as he's gone to talk to God, let's build God ourselves. These are the same people who in Egypt were crying out to God for deliverance. Am I helping you in here? They decide, let's build God ourselves. Moses has gone up to the mountain. This is while they're in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness now. Moses has gone up to the mountain to pray with God, to spend time with God, get the Ten Commandments. And they're down there thinking, what's going on? This is taking too long. They've got, they've got really, here's what they've got. They've got macrophobia. Macrophobia, macrophobia, everybody shout macrophobia. Macrophobia is the fear of long waits. And many people end up quitting on God because deep down they carry spiritual macrophobia. But you have to actually be able to allow God to do what he needs to do to get out of you what's in you. So that when you get to what he's called you to go to, you've got the character to sustain what he wants to bless you with. Pastor, hold on, hold on. You were talking about they made a God. Yeah, they made themselves a God. And the God, remember, these are people who, who worship God. Oh, God, I wish I had the time. They, they, they are so intoxicated and infected in their minds with Egypt that they were crying out to the right God when they were in Egypt for deliverance. You remember that? But by the time they're in the wilderness and Moses has gone up to the prayer meeting, they say, you know what, Moses, Moses is taking too long. Let's build God ourselves. And they make a golden calf using their earrings and their bracelets and their jewelry and some of the gold that they've taken from Egypt. They make, a gold. they make an Egyptian God because they've been so long in Egypt, their perception of what God looked like was like an Egyptian God. No wonder God had to take his time. 
Not just to get them. They got out of Egypt in one night. But it took 40 years to get Egypt out of them. Oh, God. God does not do shortcuts. Okay. Pastor, give us some good news. <laughs> The sooner we let God work out of us what he wants to get out of us, the sooner we enjoy and embrace the blessings that he has for us. We, the problem with us is we, we, it's taking too long that we dip, we dip, we dip, we go missing. We ain't seen you at church, we ain't seen, uh, you throw the towel in on God. God, this, this church thing ain't working for me, this Christian thing, I don't know, man. I'm not seeing no blessings, fam. I'm not seeing no, 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 hold on. You've got to let God get stuff out of you because he does, I've told you this before, at the risk of sounding repetitive, he does not just want you to obtain the blessing, he wants you to have the character to sustain the blessing. Sustain the blessing, sustain the blessing. He wants you to keep it. Why would he give you something that he wants you to lose? Push your neighbor. Because some of you, I just sent some of you in here, no, you've lost some stuff. Because you didn't have the character to sustain, sustain it. To sustain it. And God says, listen, no, 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 no. I will take my time. I did not take them the shortcut. Though they thought that they were ready for battle because they looked like it, I knew what was on the inside of them. They thought they were ready for, some people thought they were ready for leadership. Because I, I can speak well and I'm ready to give, give, give uh, lectures or give preaching or give teaching. I, I, I thought, I, I, but actually God says, no, 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 no. I, I won't take you the shortcut. I want to take you to long route so that we, we can get out of you what's on the inside of you that shouldn't be there. Because the long route builds character. This isn't popular preaching. I know this isn't the kind of preaching that gets everybody excited because nobody wants to hear about character. We don't want to hear about character development. We want to celebrate gifting. This is the generation that celebrates gifting. Some people are gifted, but they've got no character. Gifting is what God does through you. Character is what God does in you. Character. Nobody wants to talk about character. Nobody's boring. Nobody goes, you put on a seminar, say, hey, we're going to do a seminar day on character development. Ain't nobody there. No registrations, now, because nobody's interested in that, yet that's the thing that's taking long. Character development, character development. Here's the problem, here's what I say. I always say it like this. I say shortcuts cut character short. Shortcuts cut character short. And if we're trying to rush God without realizing he wants to spend time developing our character. Some people got married so early. And I believe in marriage. We talked enough about that last week uh, and, and week before and the week before that and the week before that. <laughs> Just say last month, Pastor. Okay, last month we talked about that. But, but, but some people understand you, you, you didn't have, you had the desire. You thought you were ready because you had the desire, but you didn't yet have the character. Oh my God. You thought you could carry a single character into a marriage union. That's why the Bible says, he that finds a wife. It didn't say, he that finds a woman. A wife? Oh, you're missing me. Somebody who's already got the character. Good God, Jesus. Character, character. Nobody wants to talk about that. And God will always take his time to build into you what he wants to build into you. And take out of you what he wants to take out of you before he takes you into your promised land. The Bible is very specific. When Pharaoh let the people go, put it on the screen, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Okay. Well, well, God, you could have led us through it and just beat the Philistines for us, but what would that have done to your character? Okay. Okay. I, 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 I did some research and some reading. And it fascinated me, you, I, I, I might post it if I get a chance online, the amount of people who took the shortcut to money, the lottery, and I'm not necessarily against the lottery, I know some churches and traditions have that, you're going to hell if you, 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 know, you play the lotto, if that's how weak God is, then Lord Jesus, we're all in trouble. But, but understand this, understand this, the fascinating thing is this, is that the amount of people it blew me away. The amount of people who, who lost it all 
within one year. Did you just hear me? I said within, somebody shout, one year. one year. Because they got the blessing. They obtained it, but had no character to sustain it. I'm not saying there's no losses. Everybody, whether you've got character or not, you'll have losses from time to time. You'll make investments. Investments go up. Investments go down. I understand all of that. But if you read what some of these people did, oh my Jesus, because they didn't have to go along. See, when you go a longer route, why do you think it takes a woman just really nine hours to get pregnant? But nine months to give birth. By the time that, that seed, that sperm has swum all the way up. Why are you all chuckling now? You all see this, this, this church, man. We're going to have another baptism service next week for all of you. Keep your mind saved now. Come on. I'm talking about by the time the seed has traveled up the fallopian tubes. Lord Jesus. Online crowd, you're the real saved people. I don't know about these people in here. By the time the seed has traveled up the fallopian tubes and has fought its way past the other millions of seed to penetrate the egg and fertilize that egg. Thank you. Praise the Lord. We've got somebody saved. Somebody understood what I was trying about nine hours. <laughs> Lord, you'll just throw me off. But it takes her, come back, come back. It takes her nine months to give birth. Why do you think that woman's ready to take out her earrings and scratch somebody's eyes out if they try and mess with her child? After it took me nine months, stretch marks, vomit, pain. If you were popping them out in nine minutes, You'd be like, take the child, child, take the child. But God designs it that way. Because whatever takes us longer, we're ready to fight for. We're ready to hold on to. We're ready to commit to. Come on now, somebody. I wish somebody would shout back amen at me. Something in you, there's a fortitude. There's things you learn along the way. God does not. Do, I've got lots more to say, but I ain't going to say. God does not do shortcuts. Let, let me show you something here. Let me show you something here. Uh, uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is Bible study. Let me do this. I'm going to do it as a Bible study. I'm not going to preach. This is just an introduction. We can preach good next week. Watch this now. Let me just teach you something here. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I want to show you two juxtapositions or, or, or a juxtaposition between two stories. I, I want to show you how much Jesus, oh, I, I want to leave you feeling good, but I want, you to be, I want you to be realistic about what's going on. I want you to see something here. Look at this. Write these down, and I want you to study them in your own time. Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, 11, Luke chapter 7, 11, Luke chapter 7, 11, Luke chapter 7, 11. It says, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person, Jesus, a funeral was going on. He gets to the town gate and there's his funeral. A dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. Lord, God, this, this is a lot going on here. Because in a misogynistic environment where women were second class citizens, not only is she dealing with an emotional breakage, but there's a financial breakage. Because if you have no son who can actually go out and bring money in and you have no husband, you're left destitute and often destitute meant you're going to become a prostitute. You ain't got time for that. The only son of his mother, she was a widow. She was a widow. No husband, no son, only son. And a large crowd from the town was with her. Watch this now. Stay with me. When the Lord saw her, Jesus sees her. He's bopping into the town and he sees this funeral. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry, don't cry. He's moved, he's moved with compassion. Verse 14, then he went up, just interrupted the funeral procession. Gee, Jesus is bad. Just rolls up to the funeral procession. He says, don't cry, baby, don't worry, it's all, it's all good. Listen, give her some tissue, watch this. Then he went up and touched the bear. They were carrying him on. 
This is the thing they rested the casket on and the body on. And the bearers, the poor bearers, they stood still. They're just carrying it. Here's this random, you, I've, I've, I've been doing this thing for 20 odd years and I've seen some crazy stuff happen at funerals. I ain't never seen this. Well, kind of one time, uh, somebody interrupted it, but that's another story. He said, young man, he's talking to the dead man. I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. I want to know what he was saying. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Oh my God. This is a random, stay with me, stay with me. We're nearly done. This is a random family. Jesus bops up, sees a funeral, sees the woman crying, moved with compassion, rocks up to the funeral and speaks to the dead boy. Because Jesus is the resurrection. <laughs> Your pastor ain't the resurrection, no prophet's the resurrection. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Dead stuff can't hang around him. He sees it, he says, get up, get up. Boy wakes up, sits up. Imagine that. Just starts talking. Don't know if he was talking about what he'd seen, where he went. We don't know what he was talking about, but he starts talking and Jesus presents him back to his mama. Can you imagine? Random people he has no relationship with. He does not know them intimately. There's no relationship. There's no connection there. And they get, watch this now, an insta-blessing. Insta-blessing. Just get up. Pop. Back to your mom. People he don't know, they get it like that. Oh, Jesus. Now let's go to, we just looked at Luke 11. Now let's go to uh, John, John 11, or Luke 7. Now let's go to John 11. Who was looking at Luke 7? Let's go to John 11. This is people he knows. This is people he has relationship with. They're family friends. Jesus is so, you know, they're friend friends. Okay? Lazarus and his sisters. Jesus can bop into their house and go to the fridge, put the kettle on himself. You know those kind of friends. You know some people, there's friends and there's friends that could come in your house. They don't need to ask you, um, you don't have to, would you like a cup of tea? That's, that's, you, I know you, but you're not, you don't know me like that. But then there's, you know me like that. They can walk in and say, fam, where's the kettle? <laughs> this is the kind of relationship Jesus has got. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. In parentheses, we get some information. It says, this Mary, was, uh, this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. He knows her. So the sisters sent word to Jesus. Lord, they sent word to him. They sent word to him. They said, Lord, the one you love is sick. He gets this text message come through on his phone. He's like, who's this? What's going on? When, when he heard it, Jesus said, he texts back, says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for the glory, for God's glory, for God's glory. Chum and spell predictor. For God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Hashtag, I am the resurrection. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed. Hold on, hold on. Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Hold on. Your, your friend's sick. You are healing, not just the healer. Okay. But he stays, to, hold on, he stays two more days. Okay, uh, okay, this is strange. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus, he's telling his disciples, has fallen asleep. <clears throat> Look at his perspective on death. But I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, if he gets, if he's sleeping, he's, if he's sick and he gets some sleep, he'll get better, right? Jesus like, look, I, guys, he's dead. <laughs> Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. And if you're sick and you get some sleep, you feel better in the morning. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. 
Watch this now. Hold on. He's your friend. Look at this next phrase. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there. Okay. 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 So that you may believe there's a purpose to this. Okay. But let us go to him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Four. So hold on, you heard Lazarus was sick. He dies. You stay, Jesus, you know these people. Why aren't you giving them an Insta breakthrough? Now, Bethany was less than two miles from, just two miles. Oh my God. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Hold it there, hold it there. I don't want to read the rest of the story just yet because I need you to understand something. What God wants to do sometimes in your character development is to take your faith from the level of just, am I helping anybody today? From the level of just belief to trust. Put it on screen. There's a difference between belief and trust when it comes to faith. There's a difference between belief and trust when it comes to faith. Everybody, everybody in here has got some degree of faith. But you've got to understand that the lowest level of faith is belief. The Bible says even the devils and demons believe. But trust is when I don't know why what's happening is happening. But I'm still expecting God to bring me through, to bless me. I'm not sure why it's taking so long, but I'm not going to walk away from God because I trust him. I'm not sure why I haven't had a career break, why I haven't, haven't, haven't had the record signing, why I haven't had the breakthrough in the theater, why I haven't had the breakthrough in the business, why I haven't, but, but I'm trusting him. Trust is a different level. Trust. Everybody talks about I believe, but actually, do you trust? Hey, hey. We know you trust when you can't see anything working out, but you're still believing him. But you're still praising him. It's taken long, but you haven't thrown the towel in yet. You haven't quit on God. You haven't walked away from church. Nobody's wondering where you are because you've got that level of trust. You say, though, though, though I can't see how things are working out, I, I, I know that God's going to work all things together for my good. I'm not throwing my praise down. My praise doesn't deflate. My worship doesn't deflate. My commitment to God and my attendance doesn't deflate because I trust him. Look at your neighbor and push him hard and say, do you trust him though? Look at the other neighbor and say, I know you believe, but do you trust him though? Okay, okay, come back to the story. Come back to the story. Watch this now. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. So he's dead, dead for real, for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. Okay, but Mary stayed home. Okay, this is good. Lord, see, there he comes now. Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, can you imagine the emotion? My brother would not have died. In other words, why did you take so, where's my church? Where's my church? Why did you take so long? But, but, but watch this. Here comes trust. Listen to the statement. Listen to the statement. Why did you take so long? But I know that even now, Woo, he's been in the tomb four days. She says, I know that even now God will give you what you ask. She don't even realize she's talking to God in the flesh. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Look at the response to her trust statement. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Here we go. Jesus said to her, I am. Where's my church? Where's my church? Where's my church? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. She replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. She believed and trusted. And as a result, Jesus walks off. Tells, ask them to tell him where, where they buried him. You'll read it for yourself. 
finds Lazarus, calls him from the dead. Lazarus rises from the dead. But look how the process took longer with those he knew. Because there was a purpose. Okay, okay, okay. The purpose was not only for God to get the glory, but he was building trust on the inside of them. Okay, the process always has a purpose. Okay, I need you to say that with me, one, two, three. The process always has a purpose. Say it one more time. The process always has a purpose. Look at your neighbor and say it to them, say, the process always has a purpose. So though it may feel like it's taking long, he's building trust into you. He's solidifying and concretizing your character with trust. Because people who have got trust, people have got that in their character. The enemy cannot blow them over so quickly. It's the people who just believe that the enemy can blow them over quickly. He can actually cause them to go off track. All they need is just a little problem to hit their life and then they're knocked over. So the enemy defeats them quickly and they're constantly on a cycle of going back to start and starting again and having to build up again. But people who trust, oh my God. God knows he can rest big blessings on them because they won't just keel over and push over and be blown over and be, be moved aside and be distracted by negativity. This is why God does not do shortcuts. He will take you along. So as you're marching forward, guys, here's what I'm trying to say to you. As you're marching forward, there's going to be times the march feels long. I could, I could get us all excited today and say, march forward, the blessing is coming tomorrow. But actually, no, it might not come till September. But that doesn't mean you throw the towel in because God understands, we understand today that the process always has a purpose. He's building something in you because he always does more in you first before he does something for you. Let me do a quick check in here and online, my online crowd, my e-tribe, hundreds of you with us watching right now, thousands by the end of this week. I want to find out if anybody is waiting on God right now, if you're waiting on God for something right now, wave your hand. Everybody in the house and online, light the page up online, put the hands up emoji. Look at all these people waiting. Do you think everybody in here always feels like marching forward? Sometimes your feet hurt with the march. You feel like throwing the towel in and the enemy wants to blow you over. But I come here to encourage you, give you a Churchill speech. I've come here to let you know like I'm Braveheart about to lead you into battle that we must march forward. Don't quit. No, 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 no. If God told you about it, then he's good enough to build inside of you what it takes for you to keep that blessing once it comes into your hand. Somebody shout, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. I need to find out. Can I find just 600 people who will give God praise right now? Show him, show him that your praise won't dip. Your praise won't dip just because it's taking longer than you expected. Because he's working on the inside before he gives you something on the outside. And, and, and this, this, is, this is just launching us into March. This is just launching us into March. Because for this whole month we're focused on marching forward. And tackling the things that hinder us. Let me give you two more and then I'm going to let you go. Real quick. This is going to be very quick, very quick, very quick, very quick, very quick, very quick, very, very quick. Snap these real quick, snap these real quick. Look at this here. The Bible lets us know something here. It's interesting to me what it says here. Because the Bible says in, in uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 5 to 8. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them. <laughs> the slaves have gone. Changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. They're no longer our slaves. So he and his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. I've come to let you know that as you decide to march forward, hey, listen to me. As you decide to march forward, your past is going to pursue you. K 
Can you trust God enough not to go back to your past? Okay. Some of you keep cheating on your future with your past and don't realize that your past was just crumbs and your future is a loaf. And as your future pursues you, it lets you know they should have known when they had you how valuable you were. It's now they're going to come chasing after you. The people who you wanted to text you start texting you. Okay, I shouldn't say that, should I? The moment you decide I'm moving on, I'm done. The moment you have that I'm done spirit, now all of a sudden everybody wants your attention. But you've got to learn this year to trust God in terms of what you pay attention to. Ain't everybody getting paid this year. I've only got so much attention. And so it's once they left, the Bible says, Pharaoh started pursuing your past will chase you down. And you've got to trust God enough even when you're lonely. Even when, even when you feel desperate to go back to that job that used to abuse you. You've got to trust God enough to say, actually, I don't go back, I go forward. Here's, here's the phrase. Can you trust God when you are pursued by the past? Some of you are too easy for the enemy hey too easy he knows just what thing from the past to send to you you'd be bopping on your way to future on your way to the future just bopping because that's how we walk in the spirit bop into the future and and the past sends a text and and the enemy knows just what to say to get you now to look back you do what lot's wife did you start looking back Looking back till you, and what happened to Lot's wife? She froze, turned into a pillar of salt. Those of you know your Bible. If you don't, just pretend you do and say, yeah, she did. (laughs) Because it's paralysis the enemy wants. Notice she froze, she became a pillar of salt. It's He doesn't want you going anywhere. Okay, okay. The moment you decide to march forward, you're going to get all kinds of crap coming out of the woodwork after you. I, I, I want to know if I'm, I feel like, I'm, I feel like this, that, was, that was prophetic for somebody. In other words, that, was, that wasn't just a statement. So if, if you heard that, if that hit different, shout back, amen. amen. Be careful of that because you can't waste time this year. It might look attractive. It might look good, but that's not for you. Somebody, some, a, a company was trying to ask me to get back involved with them recently in some stuff that I used to do. And it's not that what they were doing was bad. I just know that's not for me anymore. It was, it's not sin. It's not crazy stuff. It's something I used to do. Something I used to be involved with. Some, something I used to help them with. And then I realized, hold on, no, 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 no. I ain't got time for that. Where God's taken me, that, that's, that's not my now. That was my then. That's not my next. Number, t- number three, last one. Okay, this is horrible. Exodus, Exodus chapter 14, 11 to 12. They said to Moses, was it because there were no grave? De- so watch this, stay, 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 come, 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 take it off the screen, take it off the screen, take it off the screen real quick. Why don't we get your attention? Watch this, here's what happens. They've come out of Egypt. Okay, they're out of Egypt and notice what God said. He said he's going to lead them by the desert road. They come out of Egypt. Moses leads them to a place where They've got the sea in front of them, mountains one side and mountains the other side. They're trapped and Pharaoh and his army are in hot pursuit. When you're under pressure, you start craving the comfort of your history. Okay, watch this, watch this. Exodus 14, 11 to 12. They said to, listen to the language. Moses led them out. They're no longer slaves. But watch this. They said to Moses, was, this, is the, this is the Hebrews. They said to Moses, their leader, their pastor, their bishop, their pope, prophet, whatever they call themselves nowadays. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? 
didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve, the, let's stay slaves. It, look, at, look at the last phrase. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Okay. Because when you're under pressure, you start craving the comfort of your history while on the road to your destiny. Because the road to your destiny is a desert road. It doesn't look good. You feel trapped. You feel like you're not going to win. You're scared. It don't feel great. And if you're not careful, there's going to be a percentage of people, maybe listening to me online, maybe in this room, who are going to throw the towel in on marching forward because it doesn't feel comfortable. The road to a six-pack don't feel comfortable. The road to, a, to saving for a house doesn't feel comfortable. Anytime you're on a road to the next level, it never feels comfortable. It feels like a desert road. It feels dry. It feels horrific. It feels hot. It feels arid. You feel like throwing the towel in. You don't want to do it. And you crave the comfort of your history without realizing your history is where you were a slave. Your history was worse for you. But the bridge, the road to your destiny never feels comfortable. And you need to learn to trust God. Trust. Trust. Not just believe. Trust. Yeah, I know this don't feel comfortable right now. But you know what? And some people, the problem is many of us think that anything to do with God must be comfortable. I preached a message many years ago. I preached it, uh, part two to it more recently in the last few years called Nice Addiction. Anybody remember that one? Make me feel good and say amen even if you don't. <laughs> the nice addiction. Because there is a generation that thinks that everything to do with God is nice. I must feel nice all the time. Oh, that's God. It's nice. It's nice. It's nice. But actually, nowhere in scripture does the Bible tell us God is nice. Not one place does it say God is nice. It says God is good. He's good. But good is not always nice. Ask the person who woke up this morning from their operation that saved their life. Was being cut open nice? Of course not. But it was good for them. And we've got this mis misunderstanding about everything to do with God. And the road, some people throw their towel in on the road to destiny because that road to destiny don't feel nice. But the Bible doesn't promise us that God is nice. The Bible promises us God is nice good all things work together for the niceness <laughs> I wish it said that it says all things work together for the good of those who love God sometimes a child will be taken for his vaccination will be taken for his injections after it's been born a few years and you've got to take that child in and the child, I'll never forget the day we took Gabriella in for her injections. You have to take them, you know, it's legal requirement, etc. And she looked at us when the nurse in the surgery took out this needle. She looked at the needle, she looked at the nurse and then she looked at us. She looked at the needle, she looked at the nurse and then she looked at us. And then her face just drooped like, are you going to let this happen? What was not nice was actually good. And if we as Christians, as Christ followers, don't mature, you will keep throwing the towel in on life and on God more so when things aren't always nice. Oh my God. I'm here, I, I, I'm here to try and make sure that after today, we are determined as a church family to march forward. I'm not going back. Did you ever notice, I was going to bring a sword today, as I thought about this, but did you ever notice, those of you who know your Bible, and, and this is my last point, and I'm finished, did you ever notice that, those of you who know your word, that when the Bible describes, when Paul describes the breastplate of righteousness, he says we should be dressed ready to go forward, because he said you wear the breastplate of righteousness, You'll have the shield of faith. He said you'll have the sword of the spirit. He said you'll have the boots on. Your feet, your feet will be grounded on the gospel. He said you'll wear the helmet of... He's using analogy of what a Roman soldier would wear to show us how we should be dressed to kill. Dressed to go forward. But here's the part that always fascinated me. 
nothing for the back. You know why? Because we're always supposed to be going forward. This is what God's called us to. The very moment God introduces himself to us in the Bible, he introduces himself as a mover. It says the spirit of the Lord God moved over the face of the water. Paul borrowed. Paul borrowed from poets that were worshipping Zeus to explain how our life in God should be. Poets who are worshipping a false god. He borrowed from those poets and said these words that you think are biblical but are actually from Greco-Roman times describing Zeus, a false god. He says in him we live and move and have our being. You only live and have your being when you're moving. Moving. Moving, moving. Moving forward. I'm telling you guys, this is not the year. As a pastor, I don't just want to pastor a big church. You've heard me say this many a time. I want to pastor big people, but big people never get big if they stay static. You become, you have muscle atrophy and there'll be no progression. So I want us in this next moment as we close, I want us to pray a commitment prayer today, online and in the house. Today, I don't want us necessarily to shout and to jump and to scream, although sometimes we'll do that. I want us to be focused, lasered in on what God's called us to achieve this year and make sure that you are not going to be like the patterns of this world who by March they've thrown the towel in on what they said they were going to achieve and drive forward with in January. Let me just do a quick check. How many of you made a commitment to yourself about something, a project? It might be your body, it might be your business or something at the beginning of this year. If you made that commitment, wave your hand high, wave your hand. Well, it's you I'm talking to especially. Stand, stand with me, stand with me, stand with me, stand with me. Now, this, this is the Tab Church London, in case you didn't know. And we're very real here. Stretch, yeah, I know you've been sitting down for a minute. We're very real here. Don't stand if you're going nowhere. This prayer isn't for static people. This is for people who are on the move. Please remain seated if you're going nowhere and your life's going nowhere. I'd stand up. I, I, I'd stand up anyway. Okay. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing with you. But listen. Listen. How much must God trust you for him to have placed that vision on the inside of your spirit in the midst of all of the negativity around the world for you to be able to fulfill destiny if you keep walking with him? There must be some degree of trust God has in you. Now here we, I was going to say this, we're at the Tab Church London and that means we're a very real church. We don't just jump and scream for no reason. But I want you to tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. If already this year you've had lots of temptations to dip, to quit. Wave your hand. Wave your hand. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. Come on. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Yeah. Look. The rest of them are lying. <laughs> Lightning might find them as they walk out of the church. Imagine if that happened. That would be so fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody's walking out of church like this now. For, <laughs> for real, for real. The enemy's attacking you because he knows you. He only attacks what he knows has the potential to have victory. <laughs> if the devil believes in you, He only attacks what he knows has the potential to actually, you could, you could actually do that. He wouldn't bother attacking you if he knew you had nothing in you. Imagine that. Wouldn't it be a travesty if you got to heaven and found out that the devil believed in you more than you did? All this, all this drama he's frying against me and whatnot. I'm like, God, why is it happening? It's because the devil believes you could actually win. 
you know, it's like the child. It's like um, my dad. I remember my dad, big guy. Well, smaller than me now, but a big guy. And I remember as a child being able to just punch his belly. And he'd stand there, let me punch it, laughing. Why is he not hitting me back? Well, obviously I'm his son. Praise Jesus. <laughs> but also because he knows there's no way. You only hit back at what you feel threatened by. When Pastor Donna starts punching me at home. And she's like, you know, I'm, I'm just standing like laughing. I remember it got to a stage, even as a child growing up, where mom, mom used to try and beat us. I know that sounds very terrible in 2024. But that's how some of us grew up. You know, if you did something wrong, you got a smack. I know you can't say that now. So just for everybody online and Karens and all the rest of it, I'm not saying we need to do that now. I'm just saying, you know, back then. So, so, so she used to, she used to slap us, beat, her, beat, her, beat me, beat me, and I got to actually once I got to about, I think when I got to about eleven, she stopped. Because my mum was like a Smurf for a start. She's a Smurf. She's like, but you know, you just let her do it. So I could go on, and, and then it got. To, then she switches. And says, well, wait till your father gets home. Then I could go. What do you need me to do? But you only, I'm, I'm playing. But you only hit back. You only attack what you feel actually has the chance of, of winning. So that means the harder the enemy is hitting you might be an indicator. The harder he hits your finances, the harder he hits your health, the harder he hits your mind, it must be a sign that the devil believes in Father, please only look at the hands that are lifted and climb into those hearts and those lives. We, we heard today that you don't do shortcuts. Okay, I accept that. I see it with your people in the Old Testament and I accept that today, that you're not going to just do shortcuts. You're about character development because you don't just want me to obtain it. You want me to sustain it. You want me to build trust in you. So I'm not going to quit just because it's taking long. <laughs> this very building we're standing in, we bought this building, believe it or not. You know when we bought this building? In 2012. 2012. I dangled the keys in front of the church because we, we were already full. I'm not praying that, guys. We're already full. It's like, he's talking to Jesus. Now I'm talking to you real quick. We were already full of our old building. I just want to say this, but I dangled the keys in front of the church when we bought this building in 2012. We had to fight through racism, through polit politics. Through, I'm talking about we bought a derelict building. derelict. You'd have thought they wanted something to happen to this building. But it was a derelict. This, everything you're seeing now, that balcony weren't there, these walls, this seat, this stuff, we, we built this in. Every bathroom, every, everything you see, we built in. The back stairs, the upstairs, none of that existed. This whole section here, this did not exist. This stage did not exist. We built this. We bought the building in 2012, and by I had people telling me, "Just oh man, it's not going to happen. They're against you. You see what they're you see what they're writing. See what they're saying. What the council's doing. You see this, that, and the other. Just sell it. Just sell it." Then we went through lockdown, and lockdown. We started the construction, but there was no roof on here, and lockdown hit. And then our bank pulled out on us because all banks were shook during lockdown. They don't want to really sponsor anything, especially when it comes to uh, charities, which is in essence what the church is. I had people telling me, "Oh man, just just get out while you can." I'm talking about real good men of high men of God I could call some of their names now I won't do it but I could do it right now who are telling me I'll oh, just sell it just get out man just get out it's, it's not going to happen just maybe it's not the Lord maybe you didn't hear from the Lord and look at 2012 what are we in now 2024 that's 12 years so 12 years later we're standing here we're standing here needing a new building <laughs> Ah. 
I'm saying that to say that, listen, God doesn't do shortcuts. But I tell you now, with the amount of advice I've given to other churches about how to navigate certain spaces, the character that it builds on the inside of you, you're not pushed over easy. Okay. Now, Father, we love you. <laughs> we bless you, we thank you, and we ask you to give us strength, especially when those people feel like they feel like quitting. They feel like quitting. Those people who get disappointed by the distance. They know there's destiny. They know what you've called them to do. But it's taking so long. Help us not to throw the towel in just because we're not seeing shortcuts. Because shortcuts cut characters short. Lord, help us to resist the temptation to turn back when we're being pursued by the past. As Pharaoh was chasing down your people. Lord, let us recognize there's going to be some old things we were slaves to. Some old relationships we were slaves to. Some old mindsets we were slaves to that we can't go back to. We must march forward. Father, I pray, Lord, when things get difficult on the road to destiny, we say start craving the comfort of our history while on the road to destiny. I pray, Lord God, that we will remember that the road is going to feel dry. The road is going to feel difficult. The road won't be comfortable, but it's worth it in the end. Father, as a church family, with whatever we made a pledge towards whatever project we said we're going to push forward with in the beginning of this year, I pray that in the beginning Sunday of March, we as a family join together with each other, but we declare as an army, we are going to march forward. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It might hurt, but it won't work. And now as a sign of our commitment, we're going to give you the biggest praise. We're going to give you the biggest sound. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, praise him like you already made it.